At the height of the crisis in New York during the pandemic, Governor Cuomo became a voice of comfort for a lot of people. He was giving people straight talk about the measures they were taking to try to flatten the curve and all of that. I didn't catch the press conference, but at one point he was making a comment about God didn't flatten the curve, saying there's what people do and what God does. Now, those of you who live out there in YouTube land know who Bishop Robert Barron is. Many of you who don't live in YouTube land don't know. He's a Roman Catholic priest out of Los Angeles, and he's a does he's for a number of years he's been sort of the voice of the Roman Catholic Church on YouTube and um, very well educated theologian very excellent presentation and he called out Governor Cuomo on this over the nature of God and in a little eight minute video he gave a very sound philosophical articulation of what the church not just the Roman Catholic Church, but the Orthodox Church, the Lutheran Church, the Reformed Church, and many Protestant churches historically believe is the nature of God. This came up in a conversation I had with Brett Sockold, another Roman Catholic theologian, and we talked about primary and secondary causation. That gets very philosophical. But actually, if you read C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis lays it out in a fairly clear way. If there, was a, if there was a controlling power outside the universe, Lewis says, it could not show itself to us as one of the facts inside the universe. No more than an architect of a house could actually be a wall or a staircase or a fireplace in that house. In other words, God is not in the system. When the Soviets sent up the first satellite, the first man into orbit, and the Soviets, not the man, because apparently the man was a, um, a committed Orthodox believer, but the Soviets said, see, he went up there and he didn't see God. Now, the illustration I often use for this is, it's not a perfect illustration, but could Frodo find Tolkien in Middle Earth? And the challenge there is, well, Frodo can't find Tolkien in Middle-earth, but where in Middle-earth isn't Tolkien? And Lewis makes pretty much exactly the same comparison. Can you find the architect in the house? Well, only if the architect goes into the house. Other than that, well, the architect is all over the house, in the walls, and the stair, and the fireplace, and where the rooms are laid out, so on and so forth. And so Bishop Barron basically says of Cuomo, you really can't divide the universe that way, which is why, commonly in prayer, we thank God for technology, we thank God for science, we thank God for doctors, and we pray that God would move through the doctors. Now here's the thing, when I was young, I didn't learn a lot of this fancy fancy theology. In fact, I would, uh, I would assert that I wish my seminary had done a little bit better in teaching some of this, but the ideas were built into the prayers that I grew up listening to when listening to my father or my grandfather or other Christian Reformed ministers pray that God would work through the government or the doctors or the medicine or what have you, because when someone is healed by medicine, we say, well, God gets to claim that too. Now, I know a bunch of you are going to cry foul, but it gets complicated for other reasons where we're not going to go. So then in many ways, when Jesus, when God writes himself into the story, why didn't Jesus just fix everything when he was here? And I hear that, and I understand the question. Jesus did miracles. Why, and I'll often rephrase it, and I'll say, you know, why didn't Jesus give them the formula for penicillin? Because, you know, he could heal people that were in front of him, but give a man a fish, give a man the formula for penicillin, well, cure all of those people with bacterial infections. Why didn't Jesus sit down and give them the germ theory of biology and on and on and on? Or why didn't he just, you know, if you could still a storm, just say, okay, no more malaria, no more cancer. Um, Kenneth Copeland blew the, on a video, he, he's, he was going to blow away COVID. <sighs> Why didn't Jesus do that? Why can't Kenneth Copeland seem to make it go away? Well, 
If you think about this, and if you've listened to a bunch of my sermons, you might see that it isn't quite so easy. Well, if God can do anything, well, 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 hold on. Let's think a little bit more about what you want. Well, I want God to get rid of these bad things. Okay. At what cost to a bunch of things that you assume about the world now? You see, it's not just our limitations that we suffer from. You see, uh, and a number of years ago, I, I noticed this, that we seem to walk around imagining, you know, if the state only had infinite amounts of money, then, well, kind of the federal government's acting like it has infinite amounts of money. And, I mean, can we really just sort of stimulus our check way to solving all the world's problems? No. Because, well, when you think about the problems, some of our biggest problems involve people with money and power. And, well, here's the thing. History is full of people with money and power. Individuals with money and power. Emperors, dictators, monarchs. They've tried just that. And would you really like to live under their monarchy? What, what? If you sit and you think about this little fantasy that we have going of Jesus somehow retinkering let's say now we've got all these side we've got all these simulation imaginations in our mind jesus retinkering the simulation so that there's no more covid and no more cancer and no more all this and all more all of that well what you really want is to be sitting there at the controls of the simulation and have it run your way don't you you say well that's a horrible thing to say about me well it's true about me too and that's sort of the point of the story in the Garden of Eden. And what's been interesting is that we have all these virtual afterlife stories now where we imagine, well, before we get to death, why don't we upload our consciousness into a computer, sort of like Ray Kurzweil, and we'll have that uploaded consciousness and we'll, we'll think that, well, okay, if, 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 if consciousness is really simply a function of enough electrical connections that are working the right way, then we can map the electrical connections of the mind and we'll have that in a supercomputer because of Moore's law. And then we can upload ourselves into a computer and then we won't die. And then we'll be at the controls. Well, watch all those movies. Watch The Good Place. Watch Upload. And, and you know what you discover? We don't trust each other. We don't even trust ourselves to do this right. Our virtual reality technolo technologies are fueling our imagination on how we can live virtually. And we immediately bump into the collision between the virtual and the virtuous. Our imaginations are too shallow a pool of possibility to satisfy our aspirations. You think you may know how to, de how to um, design your own dream house, but then you meet a real designer and you realize, oh, I want him to do it. A lot of people think that they're good designers or musicians or stylists or, you know, until they meet a better one. And then it's like, oh, I'll do what they are creating. Now, we've been looking at the disciples in the Gospels. And last week we looked at this text. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this commandment. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days he'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Baptized with blessings, baptized with a gift. I mean, even, even today that word has resonance. And then he says, and then the, the next verse is, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of to Israel and it's like three years of everything miracles crucifixion resurrection and they still have no idea what I've been talking about now this baptism with water is a very interesting thing because there's always two senses to baptism one is the washing away of dirt and sin and the other is a ritual drowning it's death and life. And you can find that sense in Romans chapter 6. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And if, if you know anything about the 
the way that someone who was not an ethnic Jew would become a part of the Jewish community, it would involve a ritual bath. Now, water has some interesting symbolic connections in the Gospel of John, for example. In, with the woman at the well, Jesus says to the woman, if you had asked me for water, I could have given you living water. And he's very much connecting it to the Holy Spirit. But there's contrast and continuity going there. John baptized you with water. I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, now what makes that architect better at designing your dream house than you can dream? What makes that clothing designer better at designing clothing than you who think no one could know your taste better than yourself? This is something we bump into a lot in life. So there's an analogy happening here. This thing that this gift that Jesus is going to give will scrub you of your sin. This thing that Jesus is going to, it's not really a thing, this spirit will bring power, but it might not be the kind of power you thought you wanted or needed. So I shouldn't say this thing, I should probably fix that. This gift, I gotta fix that on the slides because if I don't do it right now, I won't get it done. This gift will kill you in a way and make you a renewed person. And when we hear that, we think, I don't want to die, but I know I need renewal, if you do know you need renewal. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And there's another knock at the door. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya, near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jew and converts to Judaism, because remember, this was a major Jewish feast that was happening in the city, and about 10% of the Roman Empire were Jews, and most of those Jews didn't live in Judea or the Galilee, and those who were living outside in other places of the Roman Empire were more affluent and probably better educated in some ways. Now, I don't know about the education part. I'll take that back. But there's a lot of stuff going on in the book of Acts between the Diaspora Jews and the Judean Jews. Okay, Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. In the last days, God will pour out my spirit on all people. He's quoting from the book of Joel. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in these days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above the signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now what's interesting here is he picks this passage because the book of Joel and this passage is sort of the quintessential description of the day of the Lord. Well, what's the day of the Lord? Well, it's the day of God's coming. It's a regular Old Testament motif. It's the apocalypse. It's revelation. It's when Warren Buffett makes the comment, 
when the tide goes out, you get to see who's swimming naked. Well, what did he mean by that? He meant you get to see who's not ready for the tide to go out. And what Peter was saying is that God has visited us and this is the day at which things are going to change. What do you mean things are going to change? Is it going to be like blowing COVID away? Is it going to be like penicillin for everyone, free health care and um, um, stim checks every month of the year? It's a day of fulfillment, a day of judgment, a day of renewal, and basically, and I've made this point in other sermons, a lot of which before my video time, it sort of reverse echoes through the history of the world. You know how an echo has a sound once and then it reverberates out? Well, in some senses, the sound comes at the end of the story, if you remember my story videos from previous weeks, and goes back through time. In other words, when the day of the Lord hits us now, as it sort of hit in New York City during the COVID, when the day of the Lord hits us, it's an echo of an event that hasn't come into time yet, but still we feel it. Remember how stories work in reverse? This is what Peter is saying is happening. And this is seen as the coming of the Spirit on these hapless disciples who, just a chapter before, seemed to know nothing about Jesus, and now it's all coming into place by reading what of all things? Stuff like the gospel, stuff like the book of Joel. So what are we talking about with this Holy Spirit? So we use this word spirit, and we use this word spiritual, and you, you find church people and non-church people using this word, and often when people use it, I'll pause them, and I'll say, what exactly do you mean by that word? And they look at me like, everybody knows what that word means, and I think, no, I think we only know like 50% of what that word means. And if you start digging a little, the word gets stranger and stranger, and more and more clear, too. So, well, what do we mean by these things? We started out talking about Bishop Barron and these causal relationships. Well, the word spiritual is all about causes because it's sort of the cause behind and beneath the material world we see. So a friend of C.S. Lewis, Owen Barfield, had some theories around this. And he noted that in the Old Testament, Ruach, and in the New Testament, uh, Penuma, in Greek, um, the same word meant spirit and wind and breath sometimes. Feels like wind, right? Is that spirit or is that, well, what happens when someone dies? We say they lost their spirit. Well, what's their spirit? That's the thing that animates them. One of my favorite illustrations of this is school spirit because, well, you all know what school spirit is. Is school spirit something we control? No, not really, although a lot of school principals and teachers wish they could because a school spirit is something that influences, but it is something that we actually also influence in terms of school spirit. It's, is it something that we participate in? Yes. Is it something that moves people and changes behavior? Oh yeah, it's very powerful. Is it something that can be deeply consequential for individual, communal, and historical trajectory? One of my favorite stories from one of my favorite storytellers is Marshall. Because Marshall told me a story about the high school she went to back in the days of Jim Crow and Louisiana's trying to keep the federal government off their back. They decided they should pour a bunch of money into a a model school for Negroes and Marsha was lucky enough to go to that model school and she showed me was able to look up pictures of it written up in in Life magazine see separate can be equal well it was, it was, this was kind of the exception that that proved the rule but everybody understood that cleaner hallways better architecture more light better teachers pep rallies good administration good teacher all creates good cool spirit which creates better education and better overall all-around students school spirit is real school spirit moves people moves matter changes the world 
can you put school spirit in a bottle? What is school spirit? Well, is it alive? Is it a person? The more you think about it, the trickier those questions get. Now, C.S. Lewis dealt with this question about spirit. You know, why couldn't just fix it all? Why couldn't he just, why go and send the Holy Spirit? Because in the Gospel of John, he says, I'm leaving, and it's a good thing I leave because someone else is coming. Well, who's that someone else? It's the paraclete. It's the spirit. C.S. Lewis talks about it this way. This third person is called, in technical language, the Holy Geist. Ghost in English isn't really good translation. The German Geist is a lot better in terms of zeitgeist the spirit of the world, the spirit of the age, the geist of the school, or the spirit of God. Don't be worried or surprised if you find it, or him, rather vaguer or more shadowy in your mind than the other two, members of the Trinity. I think there is a reason why that must be so. In the Christian life, you are not usually looking at him. He is always acting through you. If you think of the Father as something out there in front of you, or really above you, and the Son is someone standing at your side, helping you to pray, trying to turn you into another Son, then you have to think about the third person as something inside of you. And again, thing, let's see, language is really hard to navigate through this stuff, which is why theologians pay so much attention to words and why can, they can be so annoying when they correct your words. It's, some, it's someone inside of you or beside of you or behind you, really. Remember, spirit is inside, beneath, or behind. So Father is above, Son is next to, Spirit is inside, beneath, behind, moving through. Perhaps some people might find it easier to begin with the third person and work backwards. God is love, and that love works through men and women, especially through the whole community of Christians, through the church, through the Spirit in the church. Not unlike a spirit in a school. But this spirit of love is, from all eternity, a love going on between the Father and the Son. And now, what does it all matter? It matters more than anything in the world. The whole dance, or drama, or pattern of this three-person life is to be played out in each of us. Or, putting it another way, each one of us has got to enter into that pattern and take his place in that dance. Remember how you wanted Jesus to get on the keyboard of the simulation and and program it, and how if you thought about it, you might not even trust Jesus so much. You want to program the simulation, but you think, well, if I can't even be trusted to design my own dream house, what makes me think I should be designing the whole simulation? If you want to get warm, you must stand near the fire. If you want to, if you want to be wet, you must get into the water. If you want joy, peace, power, Eternal life, you must get close to or even into that thing that has them. They are not a sort of prize which God could, if he chose, just hand out to someone. They are a great fountain of energy and beauty spurting up at the very center of reality. If you And again, now, I could tinker with a bunch of these words here, but tinkering is an annoying but important habit of theology when it comes to trying to talk about these things, because our words only sort of get us so far. If you are close to it, the spray of water, the spray will wet you. If you are not, you will remain dry. Once a man is united to God, how could, how could he not live forever? Once a man is separated from God, how can he do but wither and die? So in other words, what Jesus promises is exactly what Jesus said and why it was more important than handing out penicillin. But we're still sort of stuck with, now will you restore the kingdom to Israel? Now will you make America great again? Now will you blow away the COVID? Now will you end all suffering? Now will you rearrange the world the way the good people the people who agree with me know it should be. 
It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. Peter said, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Even look at the language there. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan. In other words, God was moving through the Gentiles who killed Jesus. Remember when, we've been talking about Peter for a number of weeks, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You don't have the things of God, but of man. Well, what do you mean God was conspiring to have Jesus killed? Do you understand what we mean when we say the word God? None of us do. But we can understand a little better, a little more, which was exactly Bishop Barrett's point, which is exactly my point, which Peter could assume his Jewish audience understood. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, they didn't do it, the Romans did it. Ah, but we're participating in things. You can watch some of my other videos for that language. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Death couldn't do it. No matter how hard it tried, three days pretty much wore death out. Not completely. Now, if you begin to understand the Holy Spirit and the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you begin to understand the role the Holy Spirit played between the plays between the Father and the Son, if you begin to understand why Jesus said, it's better if I do this, you can begin to understand a lot of other things Jesus would say. But now again, this isn't something we wield. We influence school spirit, but the Spirit of God is a much larger thing. And again, large is just an image to try and give us a sense of comparison but he wields us you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses and so the application misery deliverance gratitude is repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call.